Stanford University. Not going to be about cellular automata. I Game of life. <laughs> In reality. Okay. Um, welcome to EE380, spring 2011-2012. I'm Andy Freeman, and the other course organizer is Dennis Allison. We're approaching the end of the quarter, so if you're taking the class for credit, please be caught up. No incompletes. Um, about 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, Stanford did a study on how to arrange people to, to improve communication. Um, for the most part, departments were well-connected groups. However, there was one big exception, electrical engineering. There was no reason, according to the study, to have more than one engineering, electrical engineering professor in a building. They were just spread everywhere. Um, I suspect that if that study was repeated today, we'd find that computer science was similarly spread across the other disciplines. Today's speaker, Professor David Dill of computer science, is an example of this. After doing fundamental work in formal verification, he started to apply many of the same principles to biology, which is the subject of today's talk. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, I switched from formal verification to um, biology or computational biology some time ago. And um, I, this is not the main thing that I'm spending my time on now, but I chose to talk about it in this seminar because it's the most closely related to electrical engineering and circuit design of things I've been doing. Um, uh, so uh, it is in no sense representative of any kind of mainstream computational biology. It's relatively far out there, but that's also why it's fun to talk about. Um, so um, let's see, a little bit of background here. So uh, the question is, are cells asynchronous circuits? Uh, the answer, to cut short the talk, is I don't know. Um, but uh, I'll try to make a case that thinking about asynchronous circuits is useful, about, is useful for thinking about cells. I won't give a lot of background about asynchronous circuits, but I'll tell you a little bit about my involvement in it. Um, my, um, in graduate school, when I first started getting acquainted with formal verification, my advisor, Ed Clark, who got a Turing Award just a few years ago, um, had, um, with his student, Alan Emerson, come up with this idea of model checking, which was basically to do formal verification by essentially brute force enumeration of states in a state machine. And uh, he was casting around for applications. And one of the applications that people had mentioned to him as a possibility was checking the correctness of asynchronous circuits. So uh, I was one of his first students at Carnegie Mellon after he moved there from Harvard. And so uh, uh, I got to go look at this question. And so um, what happened? was um, there were a confluence of events. Uh, uh, so uh, Ivan Sutherland uh, g had gotten interested in uh, asynchronous circuits. He's also another Turing, machine, uh, a Turing Award winner. Um, and he was visiting Carnegie Mellon for a few years doing robotics, but he'd gotten interested in asynchronous circuits, and I was sitting in on meetings there. And so I collected a small library of asynchronous circuits that had been published and uh, that patents had been written about. Now, let me explain what an asynchronous circuit is. Normally, in digital design, we're used to using synchronous circuits, where uh, almost everything is done, at least at the level of abstraction, we usually think about it, synchronously. So you have uh, everything being updated at the same time. So uh, there are various elements, gates or whatever, that do computations. It takes them a while to do the, their computation. Um, some careful circuit designer carefully figured out, figures out what the maximum time is to do all this work. At some point, the com everybody has finished their computation, and then a clock ticks, and the results of all those computations are recorded, more or less simultaneously, and then a cycle begins anew to do this. So that's how synchronous circuits work, and that's how computer designers avoid going completely insane when they're designing the circuits. The way asynchronous circuits work is there is no clock. Everything goes at its own speed. And there's some other method of coordination, often on a part-by-part -part basis, for communicating when things are done um, to, uh, from one element to another. So the idea is for uh, something not to rely on results before they've actually been computed. Otherwise, you get erroneous results. The problem with asynchronous circuit design is that 
um, things can complete in many different orders. It's an example of a concurrent system where things uh, can go at different speeds. And so if you're a human designer trying to make one of these things work, you can usually design it so it works under nominal timing. But there will often be a situation where something, one thing is much, much slower than somebody thought and another thing is much, much faster. Two signals arrive in an unexpected order someplace in the circuit and things go awry. And so they're subject to these unexpected, non-deterministic failures. Um, so uh, to return to my previous story, uh, I had collected a small database of examples of patented circuits uh, that were asynchronous circuits and things that people had published that they thought were clever designs and whatever and uh, started applying these model checking techniques, which I'll talk about later in this talk. And I was in the fortunate situation that all of these circuits have bugs. I don't think that any of them were right, including patented ones, people that had, had, been, had published, uh, designs that people had published because they were just immensely proud of finally having gotten the design right, et cetera. They all had bugs. And I one, one, learned one of the first lessons about formal verification, which is that you're in a much better, you know, formal verification is usually thought of as proving things correct. But you're in a much better position if you can take something and find a bug in it than if you prove something is correct. If you prove something is correct, then you've really gone to a great deal of effort to confirm what the designer knew all along, and nobody is very impressed. If you find a bug, it's usually a lot easier. You don't have to explore the whole design. You don't have to find all of the problems. You just have to find one problem in the design. And at the end of the day, the designer may not be pleased, but he is surprised that there was actually a mistake in the design. So he's actually much more impressed. So the work to reward ratio is much higher if you find bugs. Anyway, so I spent uh, the successful part of my PhD work uh, finding bugs in asynchronous circuits and finding new techniques for finding bugs in asynchronous circuits uh, using methods that I'll talk about today. A few years ago, I saw a slide, and I think from Harley McAdams, who's in developmental biology here, where he was talking about biology versus digital circuits. And there were like two columns of the differences between things. And I don't remember what, what they all were, but I do remember that the biology side had an item saying asynchronous, and the digital circuit side had something saying synchronous. And I thought, ah, maybe that's something I could look at. And in fact, I've worked with Harley on that question um, in another paper that we did a few years ago. So the question here is, are biological cells something that we can actually usefully consider to be asynchronous circuits? And can we use knowledge that has been gained about asynchronous circuits to try to understand them? OK, so um, this is definitely a minority view in computational biology. But I'm going to take the position, at least for the duration of this talk, that uh, there is potential to do useful Boolean modeling of uh, biological systems. And so reasons that this might be a good thing are that Boolean systems are well understood. So in the digital design world, people are used to designing, and more importantly in this context, analyzing complex systems of interactions of parts, and that's what cells are. The inside of a cell is much, much more complicated than I would have imagined before I learned a little bit of biology. Um, there exists good mathematics for analyzing Boolean systems. Uh, Boolean algebra, logic, automata theory, things that have been worked out over the last, say, 60 years. Uh, there's a lot of engineering knowledge about how to make them actually work. And there exist software tools for actually analyzing uh, Boolean systems and containing the complexity uh, that they exhibit. Um, if you read the systems biology literature, there's a lot of struggling with how to deal with high dimensional dynamical systems. And uh, that's difficult in the world of differential equations but somewhat easier when you're dealing with Boolean systems. So in Boolean systems, we deal with high dimensional uh, uh, dynamic systems all the time. Um, and we have unique ways of, of analyzing them that you can't, that nobody's actually been able to do in the uh, land of differential equations. Finally, and this is what really interests me, there's a possibility that we can discover design principles in biology. So for example, with asynchronous circuits, before I knew how to design them, I actually took an undergraduate course, which I think I, I dropped out of, where I was uh, trying to design, you know, they taught me asynchronous circuit design to some extent. Um, single input change, fundamental mode uh, design, for anybody who remembers that stuff from their undergraduate days. 
And uh, I ignored it and applied it where it wasn't appropriate. And I found that my circuits worked most of the time, but they were subject to strange non-deterministic failures. And uh, so, you know, you can't go around designing asynchronous systems that work reliably. Um, and and you, you couldn't make, say, 10 trillion copies of them like you have in a human being and uh, make them work reliably at that level uh, without having some kinds of principles for how they work. You can't just accidentally go and design an asynchronous system that works. Now, I'm not pleading for intelligent design here. I'm pleading for evolution. But I'm saying that evolution has discovered some ways to make these systems work when it's very hard for people to make them work, as, at least if they're me and they're an undergraduate. Or uh, I guess I should mention uh, all those circuits I collected that I would manage to find bugs in while I was working on my PhD. So the obvious objection, you know, what I said previously is that uh, we should look under the street lamp because that's where the light is best, not because that's where the solution to the problem may lie. But uh, so let me address the question of whether Boolean methods are actually appropriate to apply to biology. I have said in the previous slide that it would be great to be able to apply them to biology. Now I'll try to justify that it's a reasonable thing to do. Well, first of all, when you talk to biologists, a lot of them are basically using Boolean models. They're talking about genes being expressed or not being expressed, things being present or ab absent, et cetera. So they're often talking in Boolean terms. Now, it may not actually reflect reality. It may reflect their approximation of what's going on. Um, but you know, it works for biologists a lot of the time. Um, so maybe it's reasonable for us to use it as a formal model. Um, Lots of things that you actually care about in biology are Boolean, like whether something is alive or dead, right? That's a one-bit uh, summary of the state of the system. Um, whether a cell is dividing or not. So in the cell cycle, um, there is a Boolean decision to commit to dividing or not, or, or not dividing. In fact, there are various checkpoints that make Boolean decisions during the cell cycle as well. Cells are of discrete types, and this maybe is a bit more controversial, but uh, in uh, developmental biology, uh, cells are, you know, they, they seem to differentiate and people classify cells as different types. And maybe there's more of a continuum there between a skin cell and a liver cell or whatever than uh, people currently believe. But it seems like cells fall into discrete, discrete categories. And so perhaps there are Boolean decisions made on the, the fate of a cell. Um, and there's also an engineering argument for why a Boolean, why biology would work in a Boolean way, uh, sort of reasoning from first principles. That the thing that makes digital computers, you know, there was a time uh, when I was a child when I would open, you know, computer books for babies, and in there uh, it would talk about analog computers and treat them sort of on the same, on a par with digital computers. And uh, over time, digital computers won for most computation, even numerical computation. And uh, that's because um, the way Boolean circuits work limits error propagation. You can do billions or trillions of computations with effectively no errors with Boolean systems because they're Boolean, because they uh, classify things as zeros and ones and they don't use in-betweens. If you want to deal with in-betweens with a digital computer, you encode it somehow using multiple bits. And so if you think about what's happening in a cell, it's operating in a very high noise environment. It's using very low energy. And somehow it has to do incredibly reliable computation with this incredibly noisy system. And so there are certainly people who are not me who are familiar with digital systems and feel strongly that there must be a lot of digital stuff happening in a cell just for it to work. Um, OK, so I'll get into some. Uh, I'm going to give some examples. And these examples are going to be based on uh, something we found convenient to use. There's nothing really fundamental about this. It's just kind of convenient for uh, the, the examples I'll be doing which is uh, I'll call set reset threshold logic. Um, I guess I've seen people uh, propose this in, for certain kinds of asynchronous systems, but I'm not going to claim that this is important. It's just something that I'm going to use later in the talk, so I wanted to, to discuss it a little bit. OK, so I'm going to draw these diagrams with circles and arrows. 
Now, some of the arrows will be pointy, but some of them will have sort of flat heads. Uh, the pointy arrows represent positive effects. The flat arrows represent negative effects. And an element like this guy is basically going to sum the inputs. It's going to put a positive weight on all the pointy arrows and a negative weight on the flat arrows, which aren't depicted here, um, and add them. And if they are greater than a threshold, it will change the output to 1. Uh, here's the output. If it's less than the threshold, it will change the output to 0. And if it's exactly equal to the threshold, um, it won't change. It will just hold the output. So these are elements that are both gates, where the output is a function of the input, but they're also storage elements. If the inputs are tied, then they will keep their old value, so they have memory. Another concept I want to talk about is uh, the terminology of update rules. And this is uh, mostly, uh, since I, I work this stuff out for biological audiences, I'm not using classical pictures of logic gates. I'm kind of using the notation that I've seen in the systems biology literature. And I'm also doing that with the terminology. And so that's where this update rule concept comes from. So, but it's quite natural. So if you have several events that are pending. So you've stimulated several different things, and they're, both about, they're all about to do something. Um, and you're doing a simulation or something. Um, then you have to have a, an update rule that says, what, if there are several things that can happen, which one or which ones happen next? OK? So it's basically how to build a discrete event simulator. And in the systems biology world, when people used Boolean models in the past, they often used a synchronous update rule. So a bunch of things would be ready to change based on their inputs. And then all of the changes would happen exactly simultaneously. And then that would cause the outputs of some things to change. Those outputs would be connected to the inputs of other things. And so the, the changes would cause other things to be unstable and ready to change. But they would all wait politely until the next time point, And everything would update simultaneously. Um, so this is exactly how a synchronous circuit works. In the systems biology world, it was the synchronous update rule. And it's how they modeled their systems a lot of the time. Um, so they did this for good reasons. Does everybody understand what I'm talking about here? So basically, in the biology, they imagine there are a bunch of things going on concurrently, but they're updated simultaneously, just like we do in synchronous circuits. Did they get useful results? Yeah. Well, maybe. I mean, we can debate whether any of these results, including the ones I'm talking about, are, were, are useful. But, but uh, papers were written and published and uh, influenced other people to write other papers. And there were some interesting results. So the advantages of doing this are that it's easy to work with. Um, it's computationally and uh, mentally easy to work with. Um, and part of the reason it's easy to work with is that it's deterministic. So the rule says exactly what the next state is going to be. So there's no guesswork. There are no multiple possibilities of things that could happen. And it's usually efficient to deal with. Um, the disadvantage is that it's not biologically realistic. Um, so in biology, it is very unlikely that chemical reactions in a cell are somehow coordinated by a central clock. There are clocks in biology. There are oscillators in cells. They run at different rates. And maybe some activities are even synchronous. But it's unlikely that the things we're talking about, or that I want to talk about, operate in a synchronous fashion. Um, I'm not sure if I, I think I probably mentioned this uh, in the talk. But since the question came up, you know, what kind of results do people get out of this? Well, they get a qualitative idea of what the state machine is for these systems. But they're also concerned with exploring ideas from physics, particularly attractors. So what people in this field like to do is start their systems in random states and see where the, what stable states they converge to. And then they like to evaluate the, uh, whether those stable states are biologically meaningful. And they think about whether biological systems are robust. If you take a biological system and move it to a state that's completely wacky, you just start it off in a random state, uh, what everybody finds when they do this is that it is quite likely to converge in a reasonable state somehow by whatever random sequence of events that happens from there. So they're robust, and maybe that's a biologically, evolutionarily advantageous quality of these systems. <coughs> 
but it's not the primary thing I'm concerned about. So just to explain how this synchronous update rule works, I've made this non-biological system, and uh, this illustrates my, my formalism as well. So there are three uh, components. Think of these as uh, chemical species that maybe have a low concentration and a high concentration. Uh, let's see, that's not actually right. The chemical species should, should be these arrows, which are zeros and ones. The A's, B's, and C's should be chemical reactions that uh, change their products based on the concentration of their reactants. So uh, what this diagram shows is, uh, let's see, I've got these three things, A, B, and C. So um, the output of, C has an output here, which at this particular state is zero. It has these flat-headed arrows that go to A and B. And so uh, what that says is that um, this, is, this signal is basically inverted. So this zero here looks like a one to A. It's trying to make, uh, trying to make A go high. Um, now, these were threshold gates. Um, I haven't gone to check if I got my thresholds right. But basically, uh, this element uh, just takes its input and copies the negation of the input to its output. So if you're putting a zero into this because of the flat-headed arrow, it looks like a one to the A. The A um, puts a zero on the output. In other words, A is an inverter. Okay, that's for all the electrical engineers, but I think there are a few people here who aren't electrical engineers. Um, so A and B are just inverters. Um, C is something called a C element. Um, so uh, with C, what it does is look at the majority, if, if uh, the majority of its inputs is zero, its output becomes zero. If the majority of the inputs is one, it sets the output to one. In this case, there are only two inputs, so if both inputs are zero, the output is zero. If both inputs are one, the output of one is one. And if the inputs have opposite values, then uh, it keeps its previous value. It doesn't change the output. So um, in this circuit, the C element is, has two zeros for its input. So it says, my output should be zero, which is actually the output in this state. A and B are inverters. So their inputs are zero. Uh, in this particular moment of time, their outputs are zero, and so they're actually ready to change. They want their outputs to go to one. Okay, so A and B are ready to change, and since this is a synchronous update model, they're going to change simultaneously so that this arrow and this arrow both go to one. So I'm going to build a state diagram on the right-hand side of the screen as we go through this. Okay, so what happened there? Um, so the, the bit vector 0, 0, 0 is the, the logical values of A, B, and C. And what happened there is that signals A and B both went to 1, which I animated on the diagram. Okay, in this state, um, A and B, let's see, A and B are happy because they have 0 as input and 1 as output. But C has two 1s as an input and a 0 as an output. So now C wants to change. Okay, it wants to make its output 1. So that's going to happen, and will take us to a state where A is equal to 1, B is equal to 1, and C is equal to 1. And I animated that in the diagram. Okay, have I confused anybody? Nobody's going to admit it anyway. Okay, good. Um, all right, and so this is going to continue. So, so now uh, the inputs of A and B uh, are both 1. Let's see, no, I'm sorry. The, uh, what happened? Yes, the inputs of A and B are both 1. So they're going to want to change their outputs to 0 and go to this new state that I just put up on the screen. And uh, then the C element has two zeros as inputs, so it's going to want to change its output to 0, taking us back to the initial state. So that is a complete example of the synchronous model at work on a very simple system. The weird thing is that A and B somehow bo always change at exactly the same time even though there are different chemical reactions and there might be noise and different threshold, different amounts of, you know, it's very unlikely to happen in practice. So um, this is a picture of the, uh, the yeast cell cycle, which is one of the examples I'm going to give. And my purpose in showing it here is just to say the cell cycle is a bit like a state machine. It's actually a much more complex state machine than this in yeast. It's much, much more complex in people, and it's critically important. Uh, 
It's why your cells divide, and we actually have uh, multicellular organisms, or actually more than one yeast cell. Um, and uh, it's vitally important in lots of things, but uh, it's vitally important in cancer, because that's something where the cell cycle, uh, cells are dividing uh, when they shouldn't be, and if we understood the cell cycle better, we could perhaps treat cancer more effectively. Um, okay, so um, there's a particular phase, uh, G1 here, where um, the cell cycle is waiting and there's a commit point where it will start and commit to, the, the cells will commit to dividing. And so they go through uh, an S phase, a synthesis phase, um, a second growth phase, and a mitosis phase. So it's building new DNA in the synthesis phase, uh, and mitosis actually dividing into two other cells. So um, the cell cycle is not fully understood. And so there's been a massive amount of research and a massive amount of knowledge has been gained about the, cell, the control of the cell cycle. It has to be extremely tightly regulated, especially in multicellular organisms, um, because of, um, well, to actually develop properly, you've got to have the cells dividing at the right times. And to avoid cancer, you've got to avoid them having them divide when they're not supposed to divide. People study yeast because it's an easy model organism and it's quite complicated enough that it's not well understood. So uh, there's still knowledge to be gained there. So that's why I'm looking at the yeast cell cycle. All right, so our starting point in doing research here was to look at a state machine or a circuit, a synchronous circuit that had already been designed for the yeast cell cycle by other people. Um, and so there was this paper uh, the yeast cell cycle uh, network is robustly designed by Lee et al. So these are researchers at uh, UC uh, um, San Francisco. Um, and so that was published, uh, wow, eight years ago now. And so they have this model here. Uh, and this is it's not supposed to be meaningful. You're not supposed to figure it out by looking at that massive red and green arrows. Um, but um, they came up with a model very similar to the one I was describing uh, using a synchronous update rule and doing the kind of reporting the kind of results that I was talking about where they look for attractors and they look at if you start this thing in random states is it likely to go to a reasonable state and my recollection is that what they found is that almost always it goes to the G1 state where it's resting waiting for the next cell, cell cycle to start. So that was published in a reputable place and uh, gotten a certain amount of attention, attention, has been cited a lot of times. Um, but they did use a synchronous update rule. So we wanted to see what happened if you used an asynchronous update rule. Um, so before I get to the asynchronous update rule, let me talk about this a little bit more. So when they build a state machine from the cell cycle, it's tiny by digital standards. It's just 13 states. Um, and they seem to be right, so they were pretty confident that they had an approximately right model. Um, this G1 state where it's waiting for the cell cycle to, it's you know, patiently waiting for the cell cycle to uh, start is uh, an attractor that a lot of different states will go to. If you just start it up in random states, it'll tend to fall into this G1 state. Um, and what they found is if they mutated the, the thing by uh, adding an arrow or deleting an arrow or changing an arrow from an inhibit to uh, from positive to negative or something like that, it usually preserved the G1 attractor, and most states would still go to that G1 attractor. So in some sense, you could, you could uh, damage the, the, the circuit in various ways, and it would still continue to work properly. So that was a pretty interesting set of results. OK, so thinking about asynchronous circuits and about my experience as an, un as an undergrad, um, we thought about the fact that, you know, if you did this asynchronously, it would be much less likely to work correctly. Okay? Um, so, none of the, uh, I had trouble designing correct asynchronous circuits. More impressively, none of the very, very smart people who are professional circuit designers and professors teaching this stuff who designed and published circuits that uh, I happened to stumble across in my PhD got them right. Okay? so. Um, if you just string together what you think is going on in the cell cycle um, and it works synchronously, chances are it's not going to work asynchronously. Um, so um, 
thinking back to what I said earlier about evolution, you know, somehow uh, if, <coughs> if things work the way I think they do, right? So if these cells are actually working as asynchronous circuits, then they're going to have to work robust robustly regardless of lots of different variations in timing from the environment, different things are happening at different times in the environment, or from natural variation inside the cell <coughs> because it is computing with very low energy signals. So there's a lot of noise and there's going to be a lot of timing variation. And nevertheless, these cells seem to work very, very reliably. So there's something going on. These are not just random state machines that some undergrad has assembled. These are state machines that work correctly in the presence of large variations of timing, which is an impressive thing. So it was sufficiently impressive that for marketing reasons we decided to give it a name and call it timing robustness. Um, so, um, so this is like the kind of robustness that other people were talking about, but this is robustness to variation in time, not robustness to having your arrows tweaked. Um, so the notion is that evolution is going to select for this. I mean, cells might work most of the time, even if they weren't reliable asynchronous circuits. But the more robust cells would tend to be more competitive than the less robust cells. Um, and um, good, I've made the case here that uh, robustness is going to be important because there are lots of reasons these cells would have variation in timing and thus would malfunction if they weren't good asynchronous circuits. OK, so mathematically, what we can do is take the same state machine that I just showed you, but instead of using a synchronous update rule like the original authors, we can use an asynchronous update rule. And so the asynchronous update rule is if there are several updates that could happen, you pick one arbitrarily. I'm not going to say randomly, because actually we're going to try all of the possibilities. Okay? When there are multiple things that could happen, uh, any one of them could happen. So this model is really arbitrary timing vi variation. Now that's pretty harsh. In, in real asynchronous circuits and in biology, you might have orders of mag magnitude difference in timing that you can rely on to make things work correctly. But we're going to take an extreme position because we were doing research. And so we're going to take this fully asynchronous update rule that allows for arbitrary timing variation. Then we're going to use the technology I used when I was a PhD student and for many years at Stanford of model checking. Model checking does something that is very hard to do with differential equations, which tests all of the possibilities for all of the parameters. Okay? So in this case, it's a state machine with branching, and I'll give you an example of that, and we can exhaustively search all of the paths through the state machine, in essence, algorithmically, and find out what can happen for every possible variation in timing, not just ones we choose to check. So a bit of terminology is I'll call a system speed independent if it meets its requirements, whatever those are, mostly to get back to the G1 state in our case, um, for all possible delays. All right, so I'll elaborate on this. Yes? Does a, you know, sort of an infinite delay be model be handled by this model? Uh, in that case, it seems like you wouldn't be choosing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, um, which we dealt with. Okay, so um, in the, the formal verification world, people make a distinction between safety properties and liveness properties. Uh, with safety properties, it's okay for things to just stop. Okay. Uh, the way we actually modeled this is that the delays had to be finite and could be arbitrary, but had to be, could not be infinite. So things can't stop. Something, things have to eventually happen. And where that becomes interesting is if you have two, os, two things that are oscillating sort of in parallel, and this question of how many steps can one take while the other one's waiting. And the answer is any finite number, but not an infinite number. Although I think it's not actually relevant to this example. Anyway, that can be dealt with technically in using the model checker we dealt with. So I, um, I won't go into great detail about that unless pressed, but it is something we coped with. OK, so here's a simple uh, example of how asynchronous works with the same uh, fake little um, circuit that I showed you earlier. So here, uh, at the B, in the first state, A and B are unstable. They both want to change. And instead of, in the previously, they both changed at the same time, and we went to the 110 state. Here, we can go to the 100 state, 
if A changes first, or to the 0, 1, 0 state if B changes first. And if we want to, we can just enumerate all of these possibilities, building a state machine that has branching in it. And we can go through all of the possibilities, and that's what you end up with at the end. This is a very small state machine. But because you can build the entire state machine, it's got a finite number of states, you can exhaustively analyze every possible behavior of this thing. OK, so the asynchronous update rule gives you more complex behavior and uh, gives you non-determinism because there are sort of arbitrary choices between whether A updates first or B updates first, and usually gives you more states than a synchronous machine will give you. Uh, any questions about this? This one I expect. Yeah? You have 3 billion variables here, but what happens after you have like 16 or like any higher number? Uh, in, in any case, uh, there is uh, something that's very famous in formal verification called the state explosion problem, specifically in model checking. And whether you're using synchronous or asynchronous circuits, you can get an exponential blow up in the number of states. So in general, what happens is things blow up out of control. And most of the research in this area in the last 20 years has been, geez, unfortunately, it's more than 20 years. Anyway, most of the research has been in controlling that problem. But it actually isn't controlled. So what happens is eventually you can't do it anymore. Um, the big bottleneck for doing this kind of research is not handling large state machines. It's getting enough, getting models from the biologists that have enough states to be interesting. OK, so uh, that doesn't become an issue here. But biological systems are really complex. And once we have more knowledge about how the systems work, that will become a serious problem. OK, so I'm not going to talk about the other question you could have asked, because I'll just confuse you. Um, good. All right, so model checking. Um, there exist tools that people have used for asynchronous circuits and other types of systems. And the one that we're using is called the new SMV model checker. So SMV was a uh, model checker implementing, uh, let's see, symbolic model checking. So the idea was to use Instead of just building a table of all the possible states, represent them with Boolean formulas using Boolean decision diagrams, um, and uh, do all sorts of cunning stuff to try to control the state explosion problem. The first paper we wrote on this, uh, it had been explored before, but the paper that I was involved in this was called 10 to the 20th States and Beyond, um, which uh, is bogus for a lot of different reasons. But, but the basic idea is that these can cope with large state machines sometimes. And we don't need to in this case, because it's not a big state machine. So the idea with model checking is that uh, imagine a, a state graph like the one I showed you here. Imagine you have some question, like if I'm in state 000, do I always have to go through state 111 before I come back to state 000? And model checker is a program that can automatically answer questions like that. So um, it, this is a particular tool, it's free, you can download the sources on the web. Uh, it takes uh, its own funky input language uh, for describing how circuits work. It can take the queries in the form of temporal logic, which I'm not going to spend much time talking about. And then it either says, yep, that worked great, your query is correct, or it will give you a counterexample showing how the query fails, uh, which is usually a path through the uh, through, through the state graph where things didn't work out. So what we did was build an ad hoc translator. So we started with a system description that was a little more reasonable than the SMV input language and translated it into the SMV input language. And then we ran the new SMV model checker uh, on that to tell us whether um, the questions we were asking were true or false for the particular model we were using. So this system has been used extensively for analyzing hardware, software, and protocol behavior. Uh, various improved versions of this system are being sold and have been for at least a decade uh, as design tools for engineers. Uh, we're using the freeware thing uh, that is not at that level of uh, sophistication or reliability, but it worked well enough for us. And uh, so the critical thing that I will repeat here is that this new SMB model checker will check all of the possibilities. So you can ask whether something always happens. As a matter of strategy, even though we didn't really fully believe it 
we started with a very conservative, fully asynchronous model. So we assumed arbitrary delays everywhere. We thought we would have to back up from that, but we'll see what happens. And then we thought we'd run it, look for places where it doesn't work, um, where our query is false, where the cell cycle doesn't operate properly, try to understand the problem, and then fine tune our modeling strategy to deal with that. Okay, so the returning to the budding yeast cell cycle, we just started with the, uh, the paper I talked about earlier, uh, tweaked the model a little bit to work for us in ways that I'm not going to go into detail, and uh, started checking it. So um, this, is, uh, this is our redrawing of their, their model, and it's kind of a rat's nest. You know, it's not, not easy to understand how these things work by just staring at them. Uh, but you can drop them into the model checker and it will make short work of them. So, uh, you know, in some sense things kind of worked reasonably well, but when we first dropped this thing in there, it did find a problem. So we call the problems hazards, and all of the problems we found were cases where the cell cycle went part way and then got stuck and couldn't get back to G1. So it couldn't complete successfully. So, uh, this is the first hazard, and let's see if I can still explain it. So uh, this is a state where um, I say output values are stable. I hope that's right. Okay, so suppose yeah. So this is a, just a fragment of the larger of the larger circuit, right? This is a piece of this this circuit here, and I pulled it out, and so it's got other arrows coming into it. So if you just look at this little fragment, uh, that's a stable state. So everybody's inputs, everybody's looking at its inputs, and it, the output is whatever it wants to do given those inputs. So it's, it's just going to sit there unless something changes. Something can change, and uh, does during the cell cycle. And in particular, other signals can pull the CLB signal from 1 down to 0. Okay, And then uh, when that happens, uh, the model checker says, ah, oh, something bad can happen here. The cell cycle can get stuck. Um, and that's a non-deterministic thing. So what happens here is after CLB goes low, uh, CDH1 and CDC20 are both ready to change. And if they change in the right order, that's fine. I guess the right order is CDH1 changes and the CDC20 changes. So that works great. But there's nothing to require them to change in that order. There's a possibility they could change in the other order, according to our mathematical model. And so CDC20 could change first. And then what it does is withdraw this one signal to CDH1, which is, uh, would normally cause CDH1 to change. So it prematurely re removes its command from CDH1 that says to change. And so CDH1 just sticks at zero, and that causes the cell cycle not to complete. So in this fully asynchronous model with our model of the cell cycle, however accurate or inaccurate it may be, uh, uh, the model checker says uh, this is not going to work. So there's something wrong somewhere. Or, you know, maybe it's something that can happen in real cells. Comment. Yes? Since it's biology, that's OK. As long as it, if it dies, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. But as long as it doesn't do anything rash. This is a really good point. So. Um, yeah, so I was, I was putting a lot of caveats there, partly in, in hope that somebody would challenge me on this. Uh, so, you know, you got millions of yeast cells, and there are, there are trade-offs. There is some failure rate that's acceptable, and in fact, cells fail. Cells fail in all, multicellular organisms, and, uh, you know, as long as they're able, well, let's, let's talk about yeast, right? So, as long as the yeast is able to reproduce uh, rapidly enough, um, it's going to keep going. And one of the, the worries is that, you know, maybe these nice asynchronous circuits slow down the cell cycle so that um, everything happens perfectly, but it happens too slowly. And so the ones with the sloppy circuits can go faster. So that's a possibility. Okay. But uh, we're starting with a hypothesis that these things are reliable asynchronous circuits, and we're checking that with that in mind. And we found a problem in the model. So it could be a problem in the model, or it could be a problem in the biology. Maybe there are all kinds of yeast cells getting stuck as we speak because of that hazard, right? Who knows? So we decided to go read some papers. Um, let's see. 
OK. So uh, first thing is we just looked at the problem and said, well, you know, if you're an intelligent designer, you wouldn't do that because it's stupid, at least not if you had a model checker, right? Uh, people make stupid mistakes like that in asynchronous circuits all the time. The problem is that CDC20 is basically inactivating itself, right? So CDC20 says, OK, great. I'll change my output to 1. And oh, I just changed my output to 1. I think I'll tell myself to change it back to 0, uh, even if the recipient of the 1 is not aware that I changed the signal, right? That would be dumb. And an easy way to fix it is to have CDC20 signal CDH1 to change and then use the signal from CDH1 to decide that it's done instead of deciding unilaterally that it was done because it changed its output. Is that clear? What? Where was the model and the paper derived from? Did they derive it from the chemistry? Or they read a lot of papers. OK. <laughs> so that's human errors in there, too. There could be. There could be errors in the papers they read. There could be, an, you know, certainly the understanding of the biology is incomplete. Could be errors on the part of the modelers. Um, OK. So. Good. So then we actually read some papers. Um, and it turns out that it seems that you know, this, this model is an abstraction. It's not modeling all the biology. But basically, uh, there are papers that say that actually the arrow we put in, this arrow, is actually how it works, not this arrow. So it may have been a modeler error. Now, you know, the literature is not consistent. And it's not clear, right? But in this case, it looks like there are papers that say it really works the way we think it ought to work instead of the way the original model worked. OK, so that's kind of cool. Uh, at this point, you know, I got excited and said, well, maybe if we can find a few more things like that, we can actually write a paper about this. Um, so, um, and it's cool because it gives you, you know, the ability to generate hypotheses, right? Maybe we've got a design principle. Maybe this thing, these things really are supposed to be asynchronous circuits. And if you think you know how it works, and what you have is a lousy asynchronous circuit, maybe you should look at the part where the asynchronous circuit has problems and look at that biology a little more carefully. Does the buggy version actually make sense at all? Doesn't it have to be a time delay out there for that to make sense or something? There's a time delay everywhere. We're, we're assuming with this asynchronous update rule, right? And so if this were. Yeah, OK. Hmm, does it make sense at all? Um, it gets into technical details of whether you have air delays on these things or not. And uh, I think you may have a point here. So this thing may turn itself off. No, what happens is that this thing tells itself to turn off instantly, but then it takes a while to turn off. OK? So, so when this thing changes its output to 1, it immediately tells itself, instantaneously, oh, OK, turn it back to 0. But it doesn't, it doesn't follow its own orders immediately. So there's an arbitrary delay before it changes its signal back to 0. And so the race condition is between this guy setting its output back to 0 and this guy reacting to the original 1. Yes? You can estimate the probability that a cycle being successfully complete um, based on this model? We were trying not to do that, right? So there are certainly people who have written about stochastic models of asynchronous systems and looked at how many, you know, there is at least one paper. And I don't know if they got into the cell cycle, but they were doing it with Drosophila development, fruit flies. And they were trying to predict the probability distribution of correct uh, outcomes, right? So you could do that, but it's a lot harder than what we're doing. So we're trying to keep the model simple and stay away from that question. But it's a very good question. We're just if trying can, to avoid it. Yeah, if you can do that, right, you can model the growth rate of the, the cells and then compare that with the uh, measurement. Yeah. That, that kind of like yeah. check your model. Yeah. So um, I that's probably not practical at this time because of the, you know, the degree to which this model is simplified relative to the real biology. There's so many different issues in how fast things grow that um, it would be hard to pin it down to this one variable. Um, but uh, that's a pretty good idea. And in fact, yeah, I guess I won't drill down any further into that. But that, that's a good thought. Uh, yeah. 
does look a little like this Muller C element story where the, the conclusion was that the self loop should be the fastest, otherwise we have a problem. Um, yeah, so in certain kinds in, in I mean there's some simple rules of that ilk that yeah, so help uh, you clean I, up. I didn't talk about this, but in asynchronous circuit design people have proposed many different kinds of models about timing. I'm taking a pretty harsh one, which is basically assuming nothing about timing. Um, there are various things where uh, you know, there are short delays and there are long delays. And in fact, I'm going to bring that up again later. Um, for now, we don't need that. So I'm starting with the harshest possible model just to see if it works. And what happened was our harsh model found a hazard and that seemed to reveal uh, actually an error in the model, not in the modeling uh, assumptions. Okay, so with this, we kept going and we found two more hazards. Um, and there was another inconsistency between the model and the, the literature, and then we had to actually add a three value instead of a Boolean signal, but we could do that. And um, there was another problem, and in that case, we said it's, quote, supported by the literature. And what that means is the literature wasn't really clear, uh, but, you know, we could find papers that seemed, you know, if we read them the right way, uh, seemed to support what we wanted to do, but it was a bit fuzzy. Um, and after those three changes, this model is fully speed independent. So we expected that this timing model we had was very harsh and that we would have to use a more liberal timing model, but we actually didn't for this particular uh, model of the cell cycle. And most of the hazards we found seemed to be reasonable things that somebody would at least like to know about if they had this model. You know, maybe. It's like a reviewer saying, well, maybe you should take a look at this connection here and uh, s go read those papers more carefully or do another experiment to see how it works. Um, so it also supports the hypothesis that maybe these biological things are decent asynchronous circuits, right? So uh, there are only three hazards, and uh, otherwise it works pretty well. So that's surprising if you don't have the hypothesis. And so that's a picture of the revised speed independent model. So memorize it and check it. Um, OK, good. Um, so here's another thing we asked about. All right, so our idea is that evolution is somehow optimizing or uh, uh, creating circuits that are good asynchronous circuits, even though undergraduates can't do it, um, at least if they're me. Um, so uh, is there a way of testing that idea? And so we thought we came up with a computational way of doing that. So we start with the hypothesis that timing robustness gives cells a competitive advantage. So those are better cells, and in the long run, they'll swamp the ones that are not as timing robust. Um, so there's some selection pressure for timing robustness. And so um, if we can take mutations, suppose you take the thing and do random mutations, and discover that the mutations tend to destroy timing robustness, that's an indication that there's evolutionary pressure maintaining the timing robustness. Okay, so this is a bit of a subtle point for people who are used to seeing other arguments about robustness in biology. In some sense, we're saying that the biology is fragile. It's the opposite of what that other paper was saying. We're saying if you mutate something, then it's going to break the thing. It's going to break the cell. And the fact that these cells work as well as they do and that the design works means that they've somehow been continuously optimized by evolution to uh, have this speed independent property. Another question. This non robustness, it can well, it's not, as a it's form not of error detection. Error detection, I mean, these systems in many other ways have dynamic error detection and correction. That's why we're able to maintain bodies with 10 trillion cells. But this is, uh, uh, this is an, uh, it's basically an argument that the cells we're seeing are on this peak. And if you move it a little bit, they're going to be at lower altitude, right? So there's something holding them up there on the peak. And that's an evolutionary advantage. It's evolutionarily advantageous to be on the peak. Okay, so what we did was mutate the model by adding and deleting arrows. And then, if we completely broke the cell, we'd say, okay, forget that, right? It's completely broken. That does, that's not going to help us prove our point. So we remove the models that fail if when you execute them with the synchronous update rule, that's everything working in lockstep, they fail, right? So we're only going to keep the models that still work with the synchronous update rule. And then 
will go check with a harsher asynchronous timing model to see if they still work. Okay? And so what we found, so, so these things where they work synchronously are called viable mutants. So they're the things that would still be alive if not great. And so what we found out is that most of the viable mutants are not speed independent. And if you add a sequence of mutations, you get fewer and fewer uh, speed independent viable mutants. So our conclusion is that speed independent is maintained by selection pressure. Okay, now just to show I don't have infinite chutzpah, I'm not going to actually claim that we've proved something about biology here, right? This is just the first time I've seen this argument and we found a way to test it in silico for this particular model. And I was hoping to provoke some additional thought about this question. Um, so, uh, you know, it's an argument I haven't seen before. And I, I think we made our point, but I'm not going to claim, I don't even know that, you know, if I believe it. I do believe that there is selection pressure to maintain timing robustness, because I think it has to be true, but I'm not going to claim that this in silico experiment proved it. So we actually tried some other models. So uh, budding yeast is the, the standard biological model. Less is known about uh, fission yeast, a different kind of yeast. It's actually a lot different biologically. Um, but there were, was a model available, and we tried it, got similar results. Um, so when we found hazards, it was difficult to go look up the answer in a paper because the biology is not as well understood. But we did find some, some issues there, and there seemed to be easy fixes for the problems. And we took a more complex budding yeast cell cycle model um, from a graduate student in England, and we found a bunch of new hazards. And uh, because it was a more complicated circuit, uh, there were modifications that would eliminate these hazards that were not very complicated. And uh, these generate hypotheses about how the cell cycle might actually work. Previously, we go look in a paper to see if our hypothesis is true. Here, you'd have to do a wet lab experiment, and there the work uh, stopped because nobody did the experiment, or at least not that I know of. So eventually, maybe uh, we'll be able to find somebody to test these hypotheses. Not everything works as nicely as our yeast model. So I alluded to this in answer to the one of the questions. So sometimes the timing dis differences that you see in a cell are so huge that you, you say, well, if one timing delay is a billion times longer than another one, uh, we can rely on that, or biology can rely on it. There's no real point in making the system speed independent. There's no evolutionary advantage to doing that. And so we started thinking about, is there a more liberal model that we could deal with that could kind of capture this idea? And so the model we came up with is a notion of fast and slow gates. So it's still a qualitative model, but it has a little bit of timing in it. There are fast things and there are slow things. The slow things are much, much slower than the fast things. And so you can model this with another, a different update rule. And so the idea is to have, high, have priorities. And so you have bunches of components that are waiting to do something. The fast components always get to go first. And so the slow components have to wait until all the fast components are done. So if you're careful, uh, that becomes a, you can make that into a simple model that you can model check. And we did use this in a model of the Colobacter cell cycle. Uh, that we had published previously uh, because there was one hazard that we just couldn't get around. It looked like that's how the biology worked. And, uh, uh, but if we had the idea that this was a slow thing, then uh, uh, we could actually make things work. And uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because it gives you, let me see if I say it in these terms or whether I, okay. Um, it's, um, Shown, uh, anyway, so we, we tried it out on some developmental biology models that didn't work fully asynchronously. And in those cases, it seemed to produce reasonably good results. Um, so I mentioned this. Uh, uh, there's a, somebody had previously model checked the development of the egg laying apparatus, the vulva of C. elegans. It's a little worm, almost microscopic. Um, it's one of the few biological systems that's well enough understood that people could actually do that. And there are actually some, the experiments are very strange on this. There are some very strange results there. It's very tricky to get this thing to work. Um, but uh, the fast flow model seems to work about as well as the, the previous model that people had used, which was um, essentially saying that timing was almost synchronous. It just gets one step ahead or behind of something. So the fast flow model seems to work about as well as that. 
And there was a paper, you know, another well understood system is the body segmentation in fruit flies. And so this had been worked out with a probabilistic model that was much more complicated than ours. And what they found was that um, uh, it worked most of the time. What we found is if they made it totally asynchronous, um, it didn't quite work. But if we made the protein-protein interactions much, much faster than um, genetic uh, regulation, uh, the different kinds of things that happen in biology, that uh, exactly the right thing happened in the model all the time. So you might want to model uh, phosphorylation of proteins as being something that happens very fast, which is true, while upregulation or downregulation of a gene by a transcription factor is something that happens much more slowly, and so you don't worry about those things getting out of order. And in fact, that seems to work OK in these simple examples. So the conclusions, reevaluating published Boolean models with asynchronous timing instead of synchronous timing supports the hypothesis that biological systems are timing robust. So uh, they seem to work, these models seem to work pretty well even in the presence of pretty sloppy timing. Um, in particular, if we go to the more elaborate model where you have fast reactions and slow reactions, that seems to produce pretty good results. Um, and some models seem not even to require that. They seem to be totally speed independent. Um, failures of timing robustness can highlight issues that need more scrutiny, um, such as errors in your model, or maybe just something where the biology is not well understood, and you know, something that ought to be explained. Um, and modifications to eliminate hazards can yield testable hypotheses. One problem with theoretical biology it, when you do it is if you're unable to generate testable hypotheses, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just uh, at that point philosophy or something. But we can generate testable hypotheses. Now, of course, it's even better if somebody tests your hypotheses, and better yet if they turn out to be true. But uh, we've at least gotten to the point where we can generate them. And uh, this idea of checking for selection pressure by seeing if mutations destroy uh, speed independence is uh, perhaps uh, something that could give us some insight into uh, the evolutionary forces at work here. Um, thank you. So what do the biologists think of this? Oh, they ignore it. Um, so <laughs> um, when we're doing this, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to complain about biologists because they have their priorities. And um, I think, uh, I, well, for one thing, I, I could be more aggressive about seeking out collaborators. But I have spoken to a number of cell cycle experts. And they're largely working at a different level of abstraction. So this is sort of taking a whole systems view of it. And mostly, they're trying to figure out what's going on at this particular step of the cell cycle. How is it regulated? Or what's going on with this particular reaction? And so um, if you generate a bunch of hypotheses, sometimes it's hard to find people who are studying a particular part of the cell cycle where your hypotheses uh, apply. Right? So we think something is going on with this stage. Well, So um, now, if I were more aggressive and making a full-time effort to find exactly the right researchers around the world to look into these individual questions, um, perhaps I would make more headway. But I, I feel like uh, maybe the thing to do is step back or look at other systems for a while and wait for there to be more known about the cell cycle. Yes? Uh, related to that, even within electrical engineering, model checking is typically done by experts with, you know, in a group as opposed to just the random engineer actually using it. And so that sort of suggests you need a, uh, you know, to make this more friendly, but still have somebody within a biological setting that is specialized in, in doing this kind of analysis. I think that's not going to be a problem. I mean, there are plenty of uh, underemployed model checking experts running around um, who would be pleased to work on this kind of problem. So this uh, kind of talk is very well received at formal verification conferences because people are looking for new application areas. Um, so. Uh, there are enthusiastic experts available for this thing. Now, the communication between the biology and the you know, biologist and the expert uh, can be problematic, and finding common ground and interest can be problematic. But at this point, experts are available. Now, if we got to the point, and I don't anticipate this 
immediately, where every biology lab had to have somebody who did model checking on premises, just in case something came up, then we might have a shortage. But um, boy, would that be, ever be great. Uh, don't, don't expect that to happen in my lifetime. I ask the same question in a different way. Would you rather teach um, a model checker biology or a biologist model checking? Uh, I would on the biology I, side, by the way, you should probably pick a current graduate student, not so many senior. Well, sorry, what was the last comment? My own experience was I don't teach gray-haired biologists model checking. But if you pick a gra good graduate student how to deal with their computer systems, they are very rapid in yeah. learning it. But anyway. I think this work is inherently interdisciplinary because there's really a lot of biology. And I, biologists tell me, wow, it seems like there's a lot of computer science and you know, it's really hard. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, compared with you know biology, but maybe it's because you know I'm 50 something, and uh, you know it's hard to pick up all that new stuff. But it seems like a very big field, uh, so I, I would rather teach the model checker the right biology uh, if if we can figure out how to do that. Uh, yeah. It's like one of the sort of most powerful ideas in computer science is dealing with different levels, and perhaps other sciences as well, other real sciences, is dealing with multiple levels of abstraction. And so my question is, uh, have you, what other levels of abstraction have you, have you uh, considered applying this to in biology and, and in perhaps other systems? Uh, well, I guess we're covering two of them now, right? Um, for example, so, so the development of multicellular organisms, where you have cells talking to each other, and you know that that gets down to the level of individual proteins doing things, but we're modeling it abstractly. Um, I you know I think this would really get fascinating when you're talking about sort of large scale asynchronous cellular automata, right? If you're modeling, uh, you know, for for example, people are using cellular automata like formalisms to model the growth of tumors in cancer. It turns out a Cancer, a tumor, is not a homogeneous collection of identical cells. It's uh, kind of like a whole organ in itself with various specialized parts. And that determines the course of cancer. And so people are modeling those things, but they're doing it by simulation. Because I don't think they have enough detail, or they don't, don't have enough detailed understanding of what's going on to be able to model check them. Now that would be a really interesting problem to go after with model checking, I think. Um, uh, I'm not sure it's the, the suitable technique, and I certainly don't think we're, we're there yet. Um, other levels of abstraction. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to change the question, or I'm just going to answer a different question. You know, that I, I noticed that there kind of is a difference in the way that at least bench biologists think, and uh, electrical engineers or computer scientists, because People who are used to dealing with systems on a routine basis are used to having uh, achieved at least uh, sort of a consensus about what the right le levels of abstraction are. So there are different engineers working at different levels of abstraction. There are different tools looking. And each level of abstraction has to know the ones above and below it. And so relative to some sciences, we have a, a clear picture of layers of abstraction that we like to think about. And I find that. They exist in biology, but most people don't need to think about the whole stack uh, of different abstractions at one time. And so that kind, you know, if you start waving your hands about abstraction in front of a biology audience, in my experience, doesn't necessarily stimulate a huge amount of interest. Yes? Tomer. OK, you. Uh, has there been any work in um, analyzing neural systems like brains as, um, as asynchronous circuits? Uh, not that I know of. Um, and I am I'm frightened about that because there's so much that seems to go on synchronously in the, or sort of pulse mode in the nervous system. Um, but I think somebody should really do that. <laughs> and I don't know what the state of the art is. I don't know if people have thought about it at all. I have personally, you know, I'm. There's just a lot of things you, you could do, and I, there's only so many things I can take on. But uh, I think that would really be a fascinating problem. Tomer? Uh, just going back to um, these asynchronous circuits and verifying or experimentally validating them, you have these large libraries of uh, knockout experiments where every single gene in the yeast genome has been 
not has been deleted in different permutations so that you can see what's the essentiality. Does that single gene knockout kill the cell effectively? I'm wondering if that could be used as a very harsh measure to quantify the yeah. stability of these circuits. Yeah, I think I, and, uh, I probably should devote some thought to that because I, you know, it would be difficult for me to do those experiments, but I think it wouldn't be difficult for a lot of people. Um, um, so, so as, as Tomer was saying, um, there, there's a library of yeast mutants where each, maybe 100% of each individual gene has been knocked out, or almost all of them. And so um, you basically cut a wire somewhere in your, your circuit and see how things continue to work. Um, and um, so I, I think a research program could, could be embarked upon here. Now a lot of the stuff that actually happens in the cell cycle is not gene regulation. It's protein-protein interactions of various kinds. And a lot of the research that goes on is in understanding those protein-protein interactions. So uh, mutants might not be able to answer all of the questions you have in mind. Um, and that's not, I think, my impression is that's not the dominant research paradigm for people doing yeast cell cycle work. But um, it's, it would probably be easier than some of the things that people might propose. Other questions? Okay, thank you all. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.